Well, dear Francis and dear colleagues, it's a pleasure and a privilege uh, to share some comments on this truly fascinating book. I can really recommend everyone to, to read this uh, book. It's very fascinating. And as Kofi Annan says in the foreword to this book, that it's vital and urgent not only to improve our understanding of the underlying causes of violent conflicts, but also to identify the policy that can help to avoid these catastrophes and secure peaceful conditions uh, across the world. And the book really does both in an excellent way to improve our understanding of the causes and the policies. So what I would like to address in these comments, in light of the book, uh, what can we as research and development organizations actually do better? Because uh, one thing that uh, Frances has also noted in her presentation, the organization that are focused on poverty I mean, almost by definition, we are geared to work on the vertical inequalities. We spend, even here in IFPRI, also a lot of our time and efforts on how to measure poverty and vertical inequalities and what to do about it. So the points I want to make is there's a variety of possibilities we actually have in our work uh, to pay more attention to horizontal inequalities. Uh, and one is to provide more transparency about horizontal inequalities, also use uh, the tools we have to provide some kind of early warning about increasing horizontal inequalities, and then also to analyze the policy options to reduce horizontal inequalities. How well do they actually work? so that that can also provide a better basis for the development organizations to take that into account. And I would just like to present a couple of examples uh, from our work to illustrate these points. So one thing we can certainly do is to diagnose inequalities in access to basic services, and the, these are some slides from research we recently did in Ethiopia. It was led by my colleague uh, Tevo Dutch Morges. So here we look at vertical inequalities. Uh, what we see here in this diagram is uh, how many percent of respondents uh, in, in our survey had access to agricultural extension, either visit at home or community meetings or in some other forms. And we try to differentiate, do literate or illiterate people actually have more or less access? And do poor or non-poor have more or less access? So typical vertical inequality questions. And we find, yes, there were some differences, but the differences were not particularly marked. So we do not find particular discrimination against the poorer people in this case of um, the agricultural extension service uh, here in Ethiopia. We also looked by gender. So we do find a somewhat more marked difference, especially if it comes to extension community meetings. Uh, but still, it's still like 20% of women also have access to extension. But now, in the next slide, we do look at uh, the horizontal inequalities. Uh, you may know Ethiopia follows this principle of ethnic federalism. So our survey sites in different regions of the country also correspond to, to different groups, different ethnic groups. And what we find here is that uh, the inequality, which is now horizontal inequality, is much larger than any of the other inequalities we have looked here before, like in Tigray, it is uh, almost half of all the farmers do have access to extension versus in Afar, it is only 2%. So the real big inequality here is not so much by poverty, it is really across the regions. Another example, we have heard uh, Ghana was uh, one, one of the uh, cases, which is also described in the books. It's one of the cases that does have economic inequality, but it has, uh, but it has managed uh, political integration. Now here we can show how, how to use modeling tools as a kind of early warning system. This is a work done by my colleague Xin Shen, who is also here in the audience, and her co-authors using uh, multi-market modeling or computable equilibrium modeling to project into the future. If we apply the current growth rates uh, in this year, of, in this case of year uh, 2005, into the future, what will happen to poverty? And we find that here the national poverty rate will decline. Of course, we have more urban, uh, more uh, rural poverty than we have uh, urban poverty. So that's the projection, OK? So now if we look at the regional differentiation, then it becomes uh, very interesting. Here we have the different regions uh, 
of uh, Ghana and here are the three northern regions. Here we have the, the poverty rates and the projected rates by 2015. And here we have a, a scenario, so Shinchen modeled a scenario where by the year 2015, half of the poverty will have been reduced. So that country has, Ghana has met the, the Millennium Development Goals. You can say that's a big success. National poverty has, re has been reduced to 18%. Okay, rural poverty is somewhat higher, 26%. But what uh, the regional disaggregation actually shows that under this scenario, we will still have between 50 and 70 percent poverty in the three northern regions. So a huge increase actually in these uh, in, uh, equalities under rapid economic growth. And that's certainly some early warning system one should take into account. And there needs to be measures to address that. And the interesting thing is that Ghana actually, I mean, as uh, Francis is pointing out, that's one of the accommodating states, right? So the, the, the country does actually have instruments in place. In this case, uh, quite recently, uh, the, the country developed a so-called Northern Development Fund. So the money was put aside to specifically actually address that issue I have just shown. But so in, in terms of the book, there's a matrix in the book that shows these different types of policies. So it's an indirect uh, uh, policy that reduces horizontal inequality and targets the socioeconomic dimension. But there's still a lot of open questions from our work in Ghana. We know that even though you have this fund, what are really the most promising investment options? So there's certainly more work to be done on that topic, or even if you invest money, how can you improve the effectiveness of this investment? So these are certainly important questions that both research and development organizations uh, need to address. What is also interesting about this Ghanaian case, it has political instruments to reduce horizontal inequalities. In, in the case of Ghana, it has a ban on regional or ethnic parties. So parties can only compete if they actually have a, a large coverage. So in, in France's term, that's an integrationist approach. And we have done some qualitative research that shows that in spite of this ban, ethnicity still plays a role in local party politics, mostly through informal institutions. So it's quite important actually also to understand how these uh, instruments work in practice. And finally, another field where research and development organizations can do more is in looking at the policy instruments that directly aim at reducing horizontal inequality. So that was another category that Francis presented. And India is a good case because they actually have a very strong tradition in using these instruments for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So these are traditionally disadvantaged groups uh, for, for religious and cultural reasons. They also have a quota for what they call other backward castes and classes, which is more an economic uh, a combination of an economic and cultural distinction. And these quotas are used both in, in parliaments at federal and national level. They are used in the public administration, a certain seats or share of employment opportunities in the bureaucracy are reserved. And we did a survey in five different uh, government departments in Karnataka that showed that these uh, rules are actually enforced. So in the public administration, you do actually find members of the scheduled castes and tribes according to the rules. In community-based organizations, which are very much promoted by development agencies uh, for service provision, there are often voluntary rules to include scheduled castes and tribes, but they are not backed up by the machinery of the state, and we found in our survey that they are actually often not enforced. And another important field uh, that's very much studied actually internationally are the quota that are in place in the local council system, in the panchayat system. So a certain number of seats are reserved to scheduled castes and scheduled tribe according to their population share and also to these other backward castes. And then research that my colleague Netra, who is also here in the audience, uh, has done shows that these quota do not necessarily lead to the uh, intended outcome. So it's very important actually when designing development programs to take into account how they actually work. So what we did here, we looked at a program which is basically a public works program. So funding comes to a cluster of villages, that's the panchayat, a cluster of villages. And then the villages in this cluster are represented by elected uh, council members, and some of them are elected on reserved seats, so they are represented by members of a scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. 
costs and these other backward costs. And then these uh, council members have to bargain. And the outcome is that that may actually even disadvantage uh, these groups for whom the quota has been decided. This is the econometric analysis that Netra conducted. So, so here we have uh, factors that influence how much funds actually go to a village. And if the village is represented by a member of a scheduled caste or scheduled tribe, they actually get less resources. And the story is actually even more complicated because if you take into account that the seats are also reserved for this um, other backward caste, some of these backward castes are actually politically dominant. So that also draws attention to what Francis said. One has to take both the economic and the political inequalities into account. So these are politically dominant castes, and they are actually able to get more resources than the others. So that's actually the most dominant effect. And this. What this shows is that organizations that like to channel funds through these local councils, which many community-based development projects do, they actually have to take into account how these, uh, how these uh, instruments work in practice to make sure that they don't further in increase inequalities. So finally, some conclusions. Uh, I think uh, the, the book has uh, really shown to us that we need to pay more attention to these horizontal inequalities, and especially organizations that are very focused on studying the vertical inequalities have to do more. And I believe the book is a very important eye-opener here. And uh, the few examples I have shown, I think, uh, indicate that one can build this focus on horizontal inequalities into the design of both qualitative and quantitative research. And we should consider it as a cross-cutting issue, similar to gender, that, that should be a cross-cutting issue in our work. And I hope that the few remarks have also shown that development organizations that they do practical development work um, also should address concerns about horizontal inequalities in the design of their projects and programs so with regard to targeting or with regard to the way funds are allocated.